then I start again. A primer on freight transport planning, a uh, short session on that. Uh, we are currently working with the uh, framework conditions for, uh, for the freight transport sector in Norway. And uh, as a part of that, trying to predict trends, trying to find out uh, specific volumes that are transported on, uh, on, on different links is, is a challenge. Um, and if we start then with forecasting, uh, it's often difficult to make robust forecasts and particularly for freight transport. It's a bit easier to do it <coughs> with passenger transport because we can ask people, we can do travel surveys and people answer uh, according to their best of knowledge and we can, we can uh, collect rather big samples of information from, from people and we can, uh, we can uh, link that to other types of data and get quite good forecasts for uh, passenger transport. There of, of course, there are uncertainties, but, uh, but they are, uh, at least in a five to 10 year perspective, quite good. But when it comes to freight, it's much more difficult because the freight transport sector is, uh, is sort of changing all the time. And we have no, we cannot ask the, the boxes about their preferences. We can ask the managers about their preferences, but they won't answer because it is uh, kind of confidential information. They won't reveal it because of, uh, of uh, because they are uh, considering it as sensitive information. So it's hard to get hold of, let's say, microdata at the same level as we can for, for passengers. Uh, <coughs> so that's why uh, we, and also that taken together with the ever-changing structure of the global economy. You have location of businesses based on, uh, let's say, comparative advantages of different countries when it comes to, uh, to labor cost, capital costs, availability of natural resources and things like that, which if we're going to, let's say, forecast international transport flows, we need also to dig into what can be expected. What can be expected when it comes to the wage level in, uh, in, in China? Very hard to say. Uh, what can ex be expected with, uh, when it, uh, when it comes to, let's say, the global economy and the state of affairs there. We know from the newspapers <coughs> that everything is, at the moment, quite, quite uncertain. That started to get serious in 2007, and it's still highly uncertain how, how, the world, uh, how or when or if the global economy will, will recover to, to, let's say, the previous state of affairs with a stable growth. We have sort of what we call, call bubbles, where, the <coughs> where things grow quite rapidly, and certainly the bubble bursts, and, uh, and things start to, to get nasty. The real estate bubble was actually the one that caused the downturn in 2008, which was not easy to foresee for, uh, at least not for the general public, including a lot of the analysts. So <coughs> what we could say is that it's very important for, uh, for, uh, for freight systems to be flexible. And that is uh, easy to say, but it's very hard in practice because I mean, you can be flexible when it comes to uh, when it comes to the number of uh, of trucks or heavy goods vehicles that you have in your fleet, because they can they are not that expensive to purchase. It's a second-hand market for them, and uh, and that kind of uh, considerations can be made. But if, but if you talk about investments in infrastructure, in terminals, and in bigger 
units of carriers like ships, things start to get uh, much more complicated. So <coughs> we, are, we have to address the macroeconomic situation. Uh, as I said, there are shifting comparative advantages with the inflation and uh, you have these things going on where countries lose their industry, it moves to other countries, happens within Europe, happens between Europe and, and Asia, and it even happens within Asia. Where industry, <coughs> manufacturing industry now is moving out of China to neighboring countries with lower labor costs, for instance. This has, of course, impact on, uh, on the transport flows. So this is one quite hard part, and this is even worse to try to forecast the shift in origins and destinations. But okay, uh, uh, of course, if you have, let's say, a, a regional point where you consolidate cargo, let's say, in somewhere in 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 uh, Southeast Asia. And if then one of the, if you have a consolidation point, this is in the direction of, uh, let's say, Europe, you have a consolidation point, and today you feed into this consolidation point from one place, and if that <coughs> shifts to, let's say, the neighboring country like this, it may not be too serious for this part of the link, of course. But it could be cause challenges here and of course here. As you will, <coughs> as you will learn next week when uh, we have this lecture on customs and uh, incoterms and regulations, the conditions varies between countries. So we need to sort of adjust to, let's say, uh, the regulations that may shift if you transfer activity to another country. Um, and the inflation has to do with, uh, with prices and costs. Uh, this continuance is with if you shift or, or cease to, to transport cargo on a specific link. And this summarizes what I, uh, what I tried to say at the outset, that <coughs> freight companies are private entities. They are not, in many cases, willing to reveal detailed information, which is needed for, for, for planning, for instance, of, of infrastructure capacity, port capacity, <coughs> terminal capacity. Uh, they control many segments of the supply chain the freight companies in many cases. They may be embedded in a, let's say, as a th an, or act as a third party logistics operator, which takes care of a lot of things in the supply chain. Uh, <coughs> and where they, can, where they can change the way they do things uh, more or less overnight, without telling anyone in advance, and hence it's, it's difficult to, to, to forecast if this affects larger transport flows, how this will develop in the future. They also decide the allocation of freight distribution that is left to the private sector in, in most cases. I mean, if this consolidation center is located in, for instance, in China, it's a, it's a it's a, it's a matter for the public authorities, of course, because there it, this is under in, in the hands of the, of the regime. But in other, <coughs> in other countries uh, or in other, uh, under other re regimes, locations of uh, consolidation centers are left to the private sector. But even, <coughs> even if this should be a Chinese point consolidation center, um, it's often run by, by uh, multinational companies. And they can, of course, decide not to use uh, China as a location, but they may want to use Malaysia, 
instead. So they have a certain impact on this as well. Um <coughs> This is just to show you how we can design a planning process. Uh, this is a general transport planning process, which can be used for a lot of purposes. It's a, it's a way of structuring how to deal with, uh, with an impact assessment. So now we are down to a rather detailed level. A project can be a, a matter of localize where you should localize a terminal or whether you should uh, purchase um, a new piece of rolling stock or a ship or whatever. This is the hard part. This is the hardest part, to identify and analyze needs and deficiencies. And this has to do with forecasting. And particularly if you are working with infrastructure, you are working in a very long time pr term perspective. Because infrastructure investments are uh, expensive and they are long lived and they are uh, in need of, uh, of volumes to become profitable. Like terminals, roads, railways, and uh, seaports, airports, and so on. So to be able to determine <coughs> or to identify the level of demand and the characteristics of the demand, what type of cargo and so on, is the most important part and it is the most difficult part. But given that you manage to do that, <coughs> You develop and evaluate alternatives. Then you need a lot of information about costs. And uh, you may end up in, a, let's say, a, a loc localization problem, where you have to derive pros and cons with different locations, costs. Um, <coughs> you are uh, trying to derive the costs and benefits of the different actions. It's extremely important <coughs> to be open-minded uh, in this stage and try to evaluate all relevant alternatives. It happens quite often that alternatives that can be very good and feasible are left out of the analysis. So yeah, <coughs> uh, to be able to identify all the alternatives, to analyze them properly, and then go on <coughs> with the project and implement it. But it all starts here. And uh, <coughs> from the supply chain management literature, this can be translated to end customer needs. And to identify them is, as I said, it's quite, quite complex when it comes to freight, because the information is so, in many cases, so secret. Try to compare then passenger and freight planning. Sorry. Um, <coughs> freight planning often involves many jurisdictions. You can translate that to in the, in when you talk about global transportation systems. We talk about uh, many countries that are involved. Um, other, let's say, countries in the on the other side of the globe may uh, actually affect how you design a transportation system let's say in Europe or even in Norway or in Sweden because uh, <coughs> the way this is organized and uh, r operated globally can affect what you actually can do at the national level whereas patches of transport planning is more it's easier to handle within a single jurisdiction, within a single country. Apart perhaps from, from, uh, from air transport, where you need to pay close attention to what, you, what other countries do and what is done globally in, in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, in 
imposing charges on uh, on uh, on fuel uh, to to handle emissions and so on. Trip generation and attractions understood and predicted based on travel surveys. You can ask people, and you can get this information uh, quite well uh, well uh, presented. Um, <coughs> there are lots of data available, and the stakeholders are quite easy to identify. You can go directly to the if you want to <coughs> learn something about the air, air transport between Molde and Oslo, you can ask people at the airport and the passengers at the airport, and you get quite robust information. Whereas here, you have this uh <coughs> uh, you have this uh, problem with uh, data availability. Uh, they are more sensitive to market forces than uh, passenger transport, and market forces is not only connected to the business cycles, but also to, um, let's say, national conditions, maybe in many cases far away, which affects uh, the flows, and hence the, the need to, let's say, or the possibilities to do something with the transport network in, a, in one specific country depends on other countries. Stakeholders are harder to identify. <coughs> you could ask, uh, I mean, you need to work out who is the decision maker. If you're going to, to design surveys to try to find out something about freight, you need to, to determine who is actually the decision maker. You can go and ask the cargo owners and they can say, well, we are, we, we really would like to use sea transport. There is a large potential for sea transport, and they may actually want to do that. But <coughs> that doesn't help if the consolidator, the people that sort of run these points, are they are just working on a cost min basis, cost minimization basis. And that may mean that they do something completely different from what the cargo owners are saying that they would like to do. Because they, are, they, they would like to do something, but they have outsourced the decisions to the consolidators, who runs the terminals, who runs parts of the transportation operations. And the outcome may, may then be quite different from what the cargo owners say that they would prefer. Whereas passengers are the decision makers. So they are, mm, it's much easier to, to derive the true demand and the true preferences fr from them. Freight stakeholders, <coughs> who are the interest groups here? I listed them here. Um, the public sector, state, uh, trade organization, state local law enforcement, you could add perhaps also uh, interest groups like uh, environmental groups and so on. Within the private sector <coughs> you have the businesses, the shippers, service providers, the infrastructure owners and operators. And then also you have the, the neighbors, neighborhoods and communities, which in some cases could be an issue. Nobody wants to have a container port next door, for instance. It causes a lot of noise, and that may also affect, let's say, the way you, you plan such, uh, such uh, pieces of infrastructure. So in some, uh, some places that is an issue. This is um, a comparison between a manufacturing-based economy and a service-based e economy. This is the fastest-growing economy 
in, let's say, in developed market economies. Whereas this one is the fastest growing still in some parts of the developing economies. So <coughs> in a manufacturing-based economy, uh, it's a bit more stable. You have, you, it's, it's a bit easier to, to schedule the flows of uh, large shipments. Uh, in many cases, uh, you need to maintain inventory levels. You can predict, in some cases, in inventory levels. And if there is a good communication between the manufacturers and the, and the shippers, this can be sort of handled better way. More long haul movements, and if they are in a situation where they are keeping inventory, more resistance to transportation systems delays. But this is, there are nuances here, because if you <coughs> consider a um, an assembled to order industry, you are more on this side of the story. So it is, uh, it, this is valid for the service based economy, but you have to then also include assemble to order production and perhaps also make to order production. Because then you have this focus on minimizing inventory, just in time production, um, where you have the stock or the inventory on the road, more frequent deliveries. And since you have minimized inventory underway, and since there is a time criticness involved here, um, the system becomes less resistant to delays. So this is more the classical manufacturing-based economy where you have perhaps more make-to-stock uh, structures, whereas in this, on this side you have services and you have the production structure which is kind of more modern with the assembly to order, make to order production. So there is, and this is much harder to sort of make long-term forecasts for a system like this, which is very kind of dynamic, and where suppliers, you have the, you have the su supplier selection problems, where a big, <coughs> big company located somewhere can suddenly decide to change to a supplier located on the other side of the globe and uh, which affects transport flows uh, in a quite, in many cases, in a quite dynamic way. You may have innovations connected to how things are done. I went through this uh, international logistics case where you saw different ways of organizing the, the flow of goods between China and Norway, where the different uh, models direct shipments and via distribution centers in various uh, configurations. So this may change all the time. That makes it quite challenging to plan. Um, of course, if you have a centralized system where you have some fixed points, big terminals or consolidation points, this also sort of increases the predictability for the large transport flows, let's say the intercontinental transport flows. And as I said, then you can vary locally without impacting on the larger flows, uh, necessarily impacting much on the larger flows. And this system with large units, with large infrastructure investments, causes what we call a path dependency as well, where you cannot change easily because, of, because you have the, the high fixed costs involved and you cannot recover those costs uh, easily. So it's, it sort of locks 
in the possibilities to change a such a system with large units like this to change it in a, in a, in a radical way it becomes less suitable because of the high investments that are already allocated to this uh, to this system and this is actually a problem in uh, let's say in the UK there is also like in Norway there is a focus on increased sea transport to to relieve road congestion but the big terminals are located inland. The big consolidation centers are, for from historic reasons, located inland. And it costs a lot of money to, to re-establish a consolidation center at the seaside. So we have certain lock-in effects, which can in a way make it easier to, to make forecasts for these, at least for these flows, but at the same time be a barrier against, let's say, a long-run system optimization where you can use intermodal transport in a more, more efficient way. So this is also a problem in, in Norway, because the main cargo terminal is located inland I doubt that that terminal, which is located slightly north of uh, the Oslo city center, would have been located there today, away from the from the from the fjord from the seaside. Makes it much more difficult to to do intermodal freight transport where sea transport is involved, at least. So this is it on on freight planning. Now, I'm turning on to a short presentation on uh, air freight, which is the final mode that we will deal with. We have been through sea transport, road transport, rail transport, and now on to, to, to air freight. I will s tell you a bit about the various segments of the international air, tra air cargo industry and discuss the, <coughs> the feasibility of air freight. Why, why do we use it? And also a bit on how air freight rates are, are determined. So why, <coughs> why do we bother with, uh, with this, uh, this sector, air freight? Uh, it is quite important part of the international freight industry. It's, it doesn't employ much or a very high share in terms of, of volume. I think it's around a couple of percent or something. But, it, uh, but, but the freight is of high value. Time critic, expensive, uh, and, uh, and hence it constitutes a much higher share of the total value of international transport than the weight or volume shares of international freight transport. Perishable pro uh, <coughs> products, fashion clothes, n newspaper, I could also add fish, fresh fish, which, it, which is a, a big part of the air freight that takes place from Norway. Fresh salmon to, to Japan, I think it's at least one or two big freighters lifting off, off from, uh, from the southern part of Norway. Uh, I think it's twice a week going to, to, to Japan with, with salmon. Of course, short transport, uh, short lead time in transportation of such products will uh, extend the product's lifetime, the market life, the time that it can be made available to the, to the end customer. Faster delivery of spare parts to minimize downtime. It's, uh, it's very important in this region. And as I, I think I mentioned that uh, one of the previous Norwegian airlines was established based on this need to 
to transport spare parts to to uh, to ships in uh, in distant waters, and then also to to expand uh, the geographical markets for uh, for uh, companies. Components from various production sites to assembly plants. Uh, again, we talk about high-value components, uh, not not ordinary bits and pieces, but perhaps uh, sub-assemblies uh, and uh, and expensive components. And this could be <coughs> important because you may want to take. Uh, or to spend more on transport to compensate for other costs that you could avoid by using air transport. Because if the market is untested, you don't have much knowledge about the demand, so you have a very high risk on the demand side in, a, let's say, a new market, then it's easier to ship things in in a fast way in small quantities and try to see how it works and then pull out again if, if it doesn't and if it does you might turn to other transport modes because then you have bigger volumes and uh, and, and things like that it depends on the circumstances it depends on the characteristics of the goods of course and then um, reduce inventory levels and costs again depending on on the type of type of cargo you may <coughs> have a substitution effect between packaging and transport so this is also a trade off that can be made if you can avoid heavy or costly packaging by using a more or less direct uh, transport, uh, circumventing perhaps a lo uh, consolidation points, break points, you can uh, you can uh, you can handle the the cargo easier. It could be worthwhile to use use air transport. The same with insurance costs, which which could be much lower uh, when when it comes to air transport documentation, so on. And where <coughs> you have uh, reliability problems with other modes of transportation, which may be the case in some parts of the world. Let's say inland, inland Africa could be one example, where you need to pass another country to come to the to the to the seashore to to use sea transport, for instance. We. <coughs> A PhD student of mine, he tried to to derive what affected national economic growth in in, uh, in certain parts of the world, and uh, he f actually found that an airport, an international airport located in a landlocked country in the developing world, increased that country's productivity. Right, because then you can avoid heavy and uncertain uh, or uh, uncertain and expensive alternative modes of transportation, and tr then by that gain uh, benefits in the market. So that was actually one finding that that was was published from that uh, that dissertation. We talk about the high-end market. <coughs> we also talk about the market where there is a combined business with passenger transport. So you might have seen on uh, some international airports that you have dedicated freighters, freighter airlines, or in uh, aircraft, and for that sake, airlines. Uh, but uh, we use a lot of, of the freight is so-called belly freight. It's uh, 
use the, the luggage compartment of the passenger aircraft. You may have some mixed, in some parts of the world, mixed passenger cargo carriers, where the main share of the revenues came, comes from the passengers. It has a very strong growth, which tells us that this is a quite income elastic part of the transport business. So when you have a growth, because the passenger growth follows the business cycles. So when you have a growth in passenger transport by air, <coughs> you can expect that below that or underlying an underlying characteristic is a, a growth in the global economy. It's not that strong at the moment. But if you have a, <coughs> let's say if you have a 1% growth in the, in the global GNP, gross national, uh, GDP, gross domestic product, you can expect 1.5% growth in air transport. And that is more or less the case, as we see here. But here, you see that uh, the growth is, is much stronger. And you can see it, <coughs> you can see it here as well. The blue line here is, uh, is, uh, is Freight. And this is the credit crunch in uh, 2008. Which and you see here that the credit crunch causes a strong drop in air freight. And that goes together with the strong link to, to the business cycles. Whereas for uh, passenger transport, it's not that strong. You see there is a slight decrease, but not that strong. And this is actually a valid piece of information for a, for a planner, for a transport planner. Another interesting pattern here is that they, these curves followed each other quite closely up to a point here in the beginning of the 1990s. And then they started to, to move apart. And what could the reason for that be, do you think? Because I could, I haven't done that up to now at the exams, but I could just give you a graph like this and, and tell you to elaborate on the reasons for the development in the various curves in that graph. That could be a nice one. <laughs> well, it could be. Because <coughs> one reason has to do with the strong growth in the global economy. And a good, a good answer to the a question discuss this graph in terms of the development patterns. It has to do with the downturns in the global economy at, uh, in, the, in the end of the 90s and in the end of the 2000 decade. Uh, as I said, stronger linkage with the global economy, economic growth. But it started here, and why is that? Reason might be that there is a change in the global division of labor, as we say, that more production is uh, outsourced or offshored to other countries. You get longer transport distances. You get the need for certain supplies to be moved by air because of this, uh, let's say, uh, more uh, this production structure with uh, with plants located in different countries, and you move then parts between those locations. 
to a larger extent as we move along here. This strain, uh, a change in production structure, change in location, <coughs> where you make components in one part of the world, and then you may ship them to another part, for instance, from Asia to Europe, and assemble it there. You don't do that with, uh, with uh, let's say, low-value components. But one example is, uh, is again, this uh, Norwegian salmon, or cod, which is uh, caught here in the Atlantic or Nordic Sea, loaded onto a big freighter, flown to China, packed there, uh, in sliced in nice, uh, nice pieces of uh, fish, plastic on both sides, and then it's shipped back to Norway for sale. So this fish had been traveling around the globe. And one part of that, or one direction, is certainly <laughs> made by, by air transport, whereas the return transport may be by, by sea transport, because then it's frozen. And that frozen fish can stand a quite long lead time. Right? So, so there are <coughs> developments like this, and this started here. And then the next question could be, what could be the un underlying market imperfection here, or a weakness connected to this market? And then you need to think back to the, uh, to the lecture on, on, uh, on environment and pricing of, in this case, uh, jet fuel, where uh, jet fuel is not a part of the international uh, climate or CO2 emission agreements. So they don't pay any charge for CO2 emissions. If they had, Let's say they had to pay uh, some 800 Norwegian kroner per ton emissions of CO2. And I will show you a couple of pictures of big freighters uh, in the next, uh, during the next uh, session. I think perhaps these two curves would have moved more closely together. That would have affected some of that business. Like flying water from, uh, from Norway to China because that is essentially what you do when you, when you <laughs> fly fish, because it consists of 80% at least of water. I think that would have been uh, quite different in a case where you had internalized uh, environmental costs of transportation. So I might do something like that. It's a new twist, in a way, of the exam. And I can do that because you have actually, you need to think through the nature of this development. And then you should start by trying to work out, OK, this might have to do with business cycles. It might have to do with pricing of transport services. It might have to do with different location patterns, different global division of labor, international trade. And then you start stealing whatever you need from the literature that you have at hand. And you don't need to make references at the exam. Don't spend any time on making references. You can steal or borrow whatever you like. I'm not demanding references at the exam. I demand the references when you write the assignment, but not at the exam. That is very important that they don't spend time on, uh, on that. Four hours will is not much of time. OK. Uh, I think we need to, to break. Uh,